Should we start? Can you hear me? I think you can. Perfect. Hey, it's first of all great to be here at NDC Porto. I've never been to, to Porto before. Um, so first of all, yeah, happy to be here. Um, and when I usually you know, think about which conferences I, I, I would like to go, I would like to share my ideas at, then NDC usually plays a very pivot role in my selection because uh, I like the organization, I like the people, I like the other speakers, basically I like, like the concept, right? But the, the thing is, if you decide in February where you want to go somewhere in, in, in autumn of this, of this year, then you first of all need to think, hey, what, what will I talk about in six months from now, right? What is basically an interesting idea I want to share, or experience I want to share? And back then, I was mainly driven by this, you know, anti-pattern or emerging anti-pattern of building platform monoliths. And I will explain in a second what I mean by it. But after I, I you know, prepared to talk now, you know, figured out which slides I show and so on and so forth, I, I actually figured out that I could have named this talk in multiple different rarities, right? I could just have called it platform engineering for the rest of us, probably. So who knows platform engineering? Okay, then, then that's the talk for you who don't know it. So that's basically the talk title for you, right? I could have also called it Platform Engineering the Good and the Ugly because that's what we will talk about today a lot, right? What are patterns and anti-patterns of Platform Engineering? And probably also the good and the ugly and how to completely mess up, right? And if I would have wanted to make it a little bit more clickbait, I, 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 I figured out that I could have also called it Platform Engineering a newly emerging silver bullet, right? <laughs> Which is obviously not the case. But I came up with why your platform monolith is probably a bad idea. And I structured this talk now into three main pillars, I would say, right? The first one is why. So, so why do we do platform engineering? Why do we build platforms? And why do we ultimately, obviously, also end up in platform monoliths? I will talk a little bit about platform topologies. Uh, not, not team topologies per se, but of course, you know, platform are coming out of team topologies. And, and last but not least, I will talk a little bit about best practices, principles, and, and whatever this means, at least best practices in our context. But first thing first, right? Who the fuck am I? <laughs> Why should you listen to me? I'm David Leitner. I'm a principal engineer for a company called Square Solutions. You probably do not know us here in Portugal because we mainly operate in Werner and in Munich, so in Werner and in Austria and in Germany. Um, this is where our two branches um, basically exist. But as I said, yeah, I like NDC, I like Porto. So I, th I thought, okay, let's, let's come over there and let's talk about platforms. To my personal background, I, you know, I'm, I'm a software engineer, basically. I do a lot of architectural work, so maybe you're not different talks from me where I don't talk about platforms, but I usually talk about distributed systems. And you will also find this in this talk again, um, that this is basically, you know, my driving topic, you know, distributed systems, microservices, all the stuff which we're doing all the time, right? But coming back to these topics now, right? I. I usually do a disclaimer in, in front of my talks. I usually say, you know, all what I present you today is, is you know, probably correct in, in my context, right? It's, it's, you know, a story which, or experience which we made, right? Experiences we made in, in given domains, in given organizations, in a given context, right? And, and that's so important, right? I, I will not, you know, kind of, I don't have to sell you something, right? I didn't write a book, I don't do workshops. Well, I do workshops from time to time, but basically, you know, it's really just a practical report. It's basically summarized my experiences where I have in the, in the area of platform engineering. And that's why it's so important for me always to say, hey, what I tell you here today, right, worked in our case, right, worked for us, was a good solution for us, was a good idea for us. Not sure if it's, it's a good solution for your projects. And I do these disclaimers in front of my presentations now for quite a while, right? And I have the feeling, you know, they, they don't really, I don't really make it, right? <laughs> because I come then into workshops again and people say, but yeah, you know, we heard your presentation about this and that and you said this and that, right? Sure, uh, totally, totally valid. The, the, the point is just um, that whatever you hear here at this conference, you know, is driven by context, is driven by experience somebody made. And I, I, I like especially the, the, the Kenefin model from, from Dave Snowden. Who knows, who knows the Kenefin model from, or the Kenefin framework from Dave Snowden? Or just one person? Okay, that's perfect. <laughs> then you will already learn a lot in the, in the disclaimer, the longest disclaimer you've ever seen. 
But what Dave Snowden basically says is, you know, where do we make decisions? And we make decisions all the time when it comes to technical solutions, right? Then there are five different spaces where we can make decisions in. It's a disordered space, it's a simple space, it's a complicated space, it's a complex space, and it's a chaotic space. And I will not go into the details now of the Kenefin model, and it's, you know, whenever you see something from Dave Snowden, just go in there, listen to him, he has, has something valuable to say. But what he says is basically in a simple system, right, we have this idea of sense, categorize, and respond. So basically we figure out, hey, what's going on? We think, oh, we've seen this before like that, and basically we do it again. That's why we have in simple systems usually best practices, right? In more complex systems, we basically sense, analyze, and respond, right? So we cannot clearly categorize it anymore. We cannot say, OK, this is exactly that, or this is exactly that, because we are in a complicated system suddenly. And this is usually where we just can up, come up with good practices, right? We can say, this works probably, and this probably also works, right? Needs to be figured out. And in complex systems, it even gets worse, right? We usually probe, sense, and respond. And we don't have best or good practices anymore. We just basically have emerging practices, right? We do things. Understand, did it work? Okay, they didn't work, let's do it the other way around, right? Or they do work, okay, let's continue doing that, right? And in chaotic systems, basically, we just need to figure out a way how to get back to, to any other system. And the, the core essence of this slide is basically, all what you hear here today at this conference is probably about complex systems, right? So everybody who sits there and tells you, hey, I have the silver bullet for you, I have the best practice for you, right? Just listen to me, go out and do it, and all is good, it's probably a liar. To be very honest, right? Because we are in complex systems when we talk about software systems, software architectures, or things like, like, like platform engineering, which is obviously a social technical thing, right, which makes things even more complex, right? And that's just important for me to mention up front. But let's, let's talk about platform engineering finally. So this whole story starts, you know, a while ago, when, when, when we know everything back then, a long time ago, was BBC architecture, right? And I guess all of you know BBC architectures, right? It basically stands for box, box, cylinder, right? And they are connected. This is how we, for a very long time, built our systems, right? We had, you know, all the architectural diagrams basically looked like that. And the problem with this BBC architecture is that it worked out quite well. It worked out actually quite well for quite a long, 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 long period of time. But we saw, you know, that these horizontals, you know, got bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Because we put it more and more different domains, more and more different customer journeys into these verticals, right? But we had this idea that, you know, you are the team which takes care of persistence, you are the team which takes care of business logic, you are the team which takes care of UI. You know the story, right? And the problem was also obvious, you know, we had to do a change. We had to apply this change, you know, then on, on all three different layers, and it was just painful, right? Because if you needed a change, you needed to go through three teams. And, you know, we had this fantastic idea of, of verticalized systems, right? This is where we all started, where we said, okay, let's, let's shift this around, right? We want to have teams, basically, that can fully verticalize own, you know, capab capabilities, can fully verticalize own the customer journey, right? And we enable them, basically, when we need a new feature, we can go to this team, and this team can do it end-to-end, -end, right? And the idea was um, that we have then teams around customer journeys, right? We have a product search team, we have a checkout and payment team, we have a delivery and tracking team, and we have a warehouse management team. And mainly driven by, by the main hypothesis we have in our industry, I would say, since the last 10 years, right? <laughs> Which says we need high autonomy because basically this gives us high pace, right? If you take a look at, at almost everything, right? within software engineering of the last 10 years, right? If you take a look at agility, if you take a look at, at modern distributed software systems, it's all about, you know, giving team autonomy because we have this hypothesis, high autonomous teams, you know, um, create high pace. And of course, we realize this then usually in, in distributed systems, microservices, however you tend to call them. Um, and we, you know, <laughs> Fast forward, we, we totally messed up in, in many situations, right? Um, we built our microservices then the wrong way. We built them around the entities, so the product needed a user, and the user needed basically a payment, and the payment needed an account, and the account needed a user again, and so on and so forth, right? And we basically had this entity service anti-pattern, and we ended up in this distributed monolith, right? We, we all know this, right? It took us another five years to learn, hey, we shouldn't slice our microservices around entities. And that's quite interesting, because actually, 
I would say a distributed monolith is a very bad term for this, because a monolith per se is nothing bad. We should call this a distributed big ball of mud. But we ended up there, unfortunately, and you know, it didn't get us high autonomy, and it didn't give us high pace. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm fully trustful um, these days, because I see more and more organizations who really get this right, right? Who say, hey, we build you know, independent um, coarse-grained microservices usually, where we say, hey, this team can really fulfill a meaningful task, like you know, product search or, or checkout and payment, as I mentioned before. And it's all about this high autonomy, right? And we all talk about autonomy, autonomy, autonomy. But I have the feeling that we really don't fully have a common understanding what we mean by autonomy, right? Teams are usually, you know, striking for autonomy, they, they want to be more autonomous, and I fully understand this, and it's fully fair, but we always need to understand that autonomy, you know, is, is just one axis on the, on the matrix, so to say. Because autonomy, you know, you can have high autonomy or you can have low autonomy, aka high governance, right? But on the other hand, autonomy never comes for free. If, if we want to build autonomous teams, we also need to give them responsibility, of course, right? Because if you have highly autonomous teams that don't take responsibility in terms of I don't build it, I, I build it, but I don't run it, and, and stuff like that, then you usually end up in this zone where, where ops people really just will hate you, right? They say, hey, they do whatever they do. They do it in 500 different technologies, and we need to operate it for them, right? On the other hand, if you expect a lot of responsibility from your teams but don't give them autonomy, they will probably just quit you, right? <laughs> Engineers are usually quite fast these days in, in quitting if they say, hey, that make, makes no sense for me in this organization, right? And I don't say that we need to do, you build it, you run it, right? I don't say that you need to follow this, this Fogel's quote, right? Which is basically saying it all, right? You build it, you have full autonomy to build your stuff, and you run it. You have full autonomy um, to basically be responsible um, for, for this stuff, right? But usually we're somewhere in the middle, right? You build it, you own it, um, or you build it, you care, whatever it is. But basically, this is a, a obviously a very important aspect when we think about autonomy. Autonomy always comes with responsibility. And the second thing is that we, of course, then shifted autonomy, right? We said, okay, we started, and it's, you know, usually monolithical environments where we had strict governance because we have 15 teams working on the same code base, and we, you know, needed clear rules, which technologies, which frameworks, and so on and so forth. So we shifted this over the years now to, you know, kind of give the teams autonomy um, that, they, they, that they deliver in, in a faster pace. And, and the interesting thing is that, you know, when you have full autonomy and, and whoever worked in organizations which really give a lot of autonomy to the teams, and I'm a big fan of, of giving autonomy to the teams, but you often then also see, you know, the speed paradox, right? This, this what I usually describe is the red principles, right? Write everything twice. Um, we enjoy typing or waste everyone's time, right? So less we use it, right? We don't use the synergies in the organization anymore. We have, you know, these this huge silos um, where teams are autonomous, but, you know, they, at some point in time, they don't really get faster because they need to, you know, reinvent the stuff all the time on their own again, right? And this is why, of course, we understood, uh, I would say, um, uh, in recent times that we need to shift this somewhere in the middle, right? That we need to also need to have some standards, we need to have some, some governance, because they can make us as an organization faster again. Constraints are usually something good if you choose them wisely. So we usually end up then somewhere in the middle, and this is what we tend to call them the golden path, right? And fast forward, I'm obviously not the only, um, only person who, who realized this or who, who, saw this, who saw this coming, and I'm, I'm very happy about the team topologies book from Matthew um, Skelton and, and, and Manuel Pace, which, which probably gave us this, this domain language, right? Which understood, hey, we have all these this fancy microservices now, and we basically want to have, you know, verticalized teams. They call them stream-aligned teams, where we can basically bring them together and say, hey, you are responsible for something. You are responsible to order a product. You are responsible to perform a payment, or you are responsible to execute a delivery, right? And that's... <coughs> That's basically fantastic because we give those teams autonomy and um, we give them end-to-end -end responsibility. And the thing is, that's really a good idea, right? Because we figured out whenever we, you know, kind of split customer journeys end-to-end -end into multiple teams, you know, this always creates friction. This always usually creates, creates problems. So we're really strongly striving for, you know, give them end-to-end -end responsibility. It's not always possible. We'll talk about this in a second. Um, but we want to kind of, you know, uh, make these teams as end-to-end -end responsible as possible. But this leads, of course, also to massively high cognitive load in these teams, right? 
it's obviously impossible that you kind of can own everything autonomously for you know executing payments. That's why those those two gentlemen said we have obviously other teams. We, we need horizontals again in our verticalized systems, and they basically um, are there to reduce the cognitive load. The own idea, the whole idea of the other three teams, team topology um, um, named, uh, basically to reduce the cognitive load of these verticalized systems, to have enablement teams, which you know help those teams with complex technologies, help them you know to kind of you know get to know new things and and to basically um, build the systems um, uh, in the right way. And we have complicated subsystem teams where we say sometimes you have so complicated systems within you know these verticalized systems that they alone would kind of plot the cognitive load of our verticalized teams. So we basically put them out, say, hey, um, we have an own dedicated team responsible for this complicated subsystem. But again, their own reason for existence is to make the life easier from the stream aligned teams. And then last but not least, we are here, right? That's where we wanted to land at. We are the platform teams, right? We say, hey, these are basically usually technical platforms, right? They give some technical foundation. They provide cross-cutting concerns, which we need to anyway deal with in every team. And this can be everything, right? This can be an, an, an something like an IoT hub, where we say, hey, all our teams need to provide, to, need to, to kind of access IoT devices. Or this can be a design system, where we say, hey, we basically want to share design system components that all teams can reuse. Or it could, of course, be an internal developer platform, which we are talking about, right? Because the internal developer platform obviously is the cool new kit in town. And you know why it's the cool new kit in town? Because it has its own website, right? That's usually <laughs> the best reason to understand that something really takes off. But what is actually an internal developer platform? And, and there's a lot of clever definitions about what an internal developer platform should be. I like the one from even Potcher the most. He says, a platform is a foundation of self-service APIs, tools and services, knowledge and support, which are arranged as compelling internal products, right? Autonomous delivery teams can make use of the platforms to deliver product features at a higher pace. And, and that's basically it. What I said before to, to, to uh, complex subsystem teams and enabling teams, their own goal is basically to reduce cognitive load from stream-aligned teams and make them basically faster. So how does this usually look like, right? So as I said before, we have you know, the stream-aligned teams, and we start to say, hey, all of these teams obviously needs to operate a Kubernetes cluster, right? We don't want that each team needs to take care of, you know, setting up Kubernetes, upgrading it every three months, you know, dealing with it and so on and so forth, ha having, uh, you know, experienced knowledge in, in how to deal with Kubernetes and so on and so forth, right? So this is why we started, I would say, around about two to three to four to five years um, with this idea of, hey, you know, we have now these verticalized teams, but we, we need this horizontal team again, right? We need these platform teams. And these platform teams then should, you know, take care of Kubernetes. They should say, hey, okay, nice. You have your Kubernetes cluster, um, but we will, we will handle that for you, right? So again, we reduce your cognitive load in the team because you don't need to take care of Kubernetes anymore, which is obviously a great idea, right? And these platform teams then obviously grow, right? They need to take care of, you know, the baseline functionality like monitoring, alerting, tracing, logging, you know, all the things which you as a team usually don't really want to take care of and which is quite nice if, you know, somebody else gives you this, this foundation to, to reduce again, as I said, your cognitive load. And at some point in time, you know, inventory from architectures, all these things popped up, and we need a Kafka and so on and so forth, and we probably need backstage, whatever we need, right? Whatever we need, we put it in the platform team, right? <laughs> and you know, the thing about cognitive load is it's not going away, right? You cannot erase it. It's there. It's just a question where you push it to, right? And we were enormously good in the last couple of years to push these cognitive loads, from the streamer line teams, which can now really deliver nice features, to the platform teams, right? Which, which have the issue which we wanted to avoid in the first place, that they become the bottleneck because they say, hey, I cannot deal with this whole CNCF landscape anymore, and I actually also don't want to deal with it anymore. Um, but basically, we, we have a problem here, right? And the second thing is, of course, that these, you know, very monolithical platforms, these very monolithical platform teams, tend to have this problem that they are really hard to evolve. Right? Because they have dependencies, of course, to all the streamline teams. Right? Everybody is using their Kubernetes cluster. Everybody is using their product ABC. Right? And it's really hard to say, hey, I, I want to 
switch from this product to a new product, which which is obviously which is obviously um, better in, in in terms of of, of how it how it can provide us features or how it deals with resources, right? And these dependencies are, of course, um, are painful, right? Um, and these dependencies are, of course, there. Um, but they make the system hard to involve. And that's one of the big problems which we see in platform engineering, that these monolithical platforms usually are not built from scratch, right? Nobody from us builds a platform from scratch. We, we use Kubernetes, we use um, AKS, we use hyperscalers, whatever we have, right? We build it on top of something. And so our platform basically lives on such a base platform. And the problem is if you build a platform like I just showed you before, by you know, just dumping tools out into a platform team, then the chances are quite high that the base platform, of course, will heavily evolve over time, but your platform um, will, will, will stay the same, right? And, and this is what we usually tend to call a thinking platform, right? A platform which cannot keep track, you know, of how, you know, things around it are changing, right? Which is still using um, um, old, um, old technologies all through. We all know that this would be much better to kind of shift over to this, would make the developers much more efficient and so on and so forth. But we are just bound, right? Because we have this huge cognitive load in the team and we basically have this, you know, clear dependencies um, to a lot of streamlined teams which we cannot really deal with. Right? And of course, we want to end up in this floating platform where we say, hey, we build a platform in a way um, that, it, that, it basically, that it basically can float on this base platform. And there's, of course, much more problems with this idea of, of, of these platform monoliths, um, which is, of course, a resilience issue. Right? If your Kubernetes here blows up, chances are high you know, that your whole system suddenly blows up, right? Because, you know, your Kubernetes is broken. The team which is taking responsibility for it obviously did a mistake, and mistakes unfortunately happen, right? And um, the resilience, the blaze radius is, of course, enormous if you say, hey, we have, you know, this, this single platform team taking care of it. And that's basically quite interesting because if you have then you know such a platform which is you know blowing up from time to time which you know kind of has again resilience issues then ag again decreases a little bit the cognitive load of your stream aligned teams because you know it's not nice if you say okay cool we have a platform but you know it's it's not really doing its job well and that's you know one of the the core essences of having a platform it's, it's a product basically right it, it should provide value to the customers and the customers and the application teams and this is usually where we then, you know, end up and where we stay, okay, and say, cool, yeah, that, that, that's our platform team, right? We build it up now for three years, and here we are. And, uh, you know, this, this, this beautiful platform monolith got born, and, and we now need to deal with it, and probably it has the same issues which we wanted to avoid in the first place, that we have, you know, this, this single organizational and, and resilience bottleneck. And the, the first thing I think we, we, we better need to understand here is that a platform is a product, as I mentioned before, right? It's a product which you are internally building for your development teams, right? That's why you build a platform, right? And, and the thing is, you provide basically the golden path to your teams, right? You give them, the, 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 I would say, the promise that in 80% of the cases, they can build up on this platform their stuff faster and easier. But it's important, it's a golden path, right? It's not a golden highway, you know, which fulfills all needs. It says, hey, you know, we, we, we have these classical use cases, and if you just, you know, follow these ideas, these rules, um, you know, this, this, this platform really helps you, right? I, I basically, like the, 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 the terminology of pawn um, path, much more, which is basically saying the concept, but we say, hey, we cannot, you know, fulfill every need within the organization. Um, we, basically, um, we basically, you know, take a look at a few things which are opinionated to our organization and say, okay, you need a microservice, a Postgres database, and a, and a RapidMQ. We can do this for you quite easily, right? But if you need some, some, some other curative stuff like in, in IE machine learning product, then we probably will not provide it for you as a platform. But you can leave the golden parts, right? You can do your own stuff, but then it's again your responsibility, right? And then we're back at the responsibility topic, right? But even if we do this, even if we just say, hey, we focus on this 80% of the use cases which we really want to provide a good answer to, um, as I said before, that the result, and, and I've seen this now multiple times, that's why I, that's why I thought in, in February that this is a nice topic to talk about, um, is that 
we have this high cognitive load in the platform teams, and the platform teams, you know, become our bottleneck when it comes to to, to delivery pace and and you know um, what we what we actually wanted to achieve in the first place. And what you often then see, and I, I see this now, I would say on a nearly weekly basis, is that teams start to restructure the their, their platform teams, right? To figure this out, they said, hey, it's, it's obviously elusive. It was elusive from the first day on that you know seven. DevOps engineers, you know, can operate the whole platform for 25 um, stream-aligned teams. And, and what we often see then is this concept of sub-platforms, right? We say, hey, we have an application platform which is taking care of Kubernetes clusters. We have an integration platform which is taking care of, you know, kind of all integration means like API gateways or Kafka um, streams, whatever it is. And um, this, of course, reduces the cognitive load within the teams, right? It, it has this downside that and usually makes also the golden path a little bit harder um, to define because suddenly, you know, the golden path is driven by multiple teams. Um, and it, of course, still has this issue of the, the high blast radius, right? That is, okay, if Kubernetes goes down, probably everything is down again, right? And we have, again, answers for this, right? We, of course, have in, in, in Kubernetes things like dedicated node pools and, and stuff like this. Basically, we, we do it with, with sharding, right? We, we basically provide, you know, more resilient systems, we, we run multiple instances of Kafka, we maybe run multiple node pools, we even run multiple Kubernetes clusters to ensure, you know, when something goes down, it doesn't affect, you know, everyone, it just affects a single team because things will go down, right? That's unavoidable. The, the point is just that if you do this again, <laughs> you see we're running in circles, right? If you do this again, um, obviously, the management complexity gets enormously, right? And you basically blow up your cognitive load again of your platform teams, and you know they will be slow in you know delivering new features to your platform. Basically, keeping the platform even up to date is then usually a challenge, right? So we have these two obvious options, right? We can go with this um, monolithical platform, or we can go with this more sharded platform, where we basically take ownership of all the shards, you know, swimming around. And, and the problem is the first one, as I said before, is to, the chance is quite high that it's sinking, right? At some point in time, it will just blow up and everybody in the organization will say, okay, we cannot do anything because obviously our platform is down, right? The problem is the second one is that the management complexity is, is massively high, right? It, it will happen that you just cannot be, you know, able to manage um, 50 plus Kubernetes clusters anymore. And this is now the core essence of this whole presentation that I think both approaches I don't say they are wrong, they, they can be a good enough solution um, depending on your scale, but both solutions really have you know, this, 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 this core problem um, that you basically don't want to operate the ship, but you want to be the dockyard, right? You want to be that person which builds the ship, right? Which gives the ship to others. And what do I mean by this? I, I think in platform engineering, there's this massive misunderstanding, to, to be really honest, that we consider platform engineering as, you know, operations 2.0. And that's not the case, right? Pla platform engineering is not operations. It's not to say, hey, here's my Docker image deployed, please, in your Kubernetes cluster, or here's my image run it in the Kubernetes cluster, which you are taking care of it. Oh, my image blown up the Kubernetes cluster, sorry, I <laughs> didn't know this before, right? So the idea of a platform team is really to provide platforms and, and to provide them into the teams. And I will elaborate on this in a second, what I mean by this. Um, but basically, those teams need to take ownership of, of these things again, right? The, if you take a look at the CNCN landscape, it's, it's just too big that you can imagine that you know just a few teams in the organization can manage it. But they should provide it in a way um, that we know we have some kind of sensible defaults um, and that we have a possibility to provide these abstraction, these useful platform to teams. Um, but we do not own it, and that's the most important part here. And, and this sounds now maybe elusive, but this is basically how each hyperscaler in the world provides platforms, right? AWS gives you a Kubernetes cluster, right? But, but you are responsible for it, right? And they give you some base SLAs, sure, right? But in the end, it's, it's your responsibility that you do not deploy trash into your Kubernetes cluster, right? They will not take care of it, right? They say, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Didn't know what you're doing with our Kubernetes cluster, right? And, and I think that's much more the mindset which we need to have when we build platforms. 
And as I promised, I, I, I also want to give you a simple example how we often do this. It goes a little bit deeper into technology now, um, but basically, how can you achieve this? And I'm a big fan, of course, to you know, um, define an API for our engineering teams. That's what we do as platforms, right? We provide the API for our engineering teams to work on. And I'm a big fan of doing this in YAML, of course, right? I'm a, I'm a big YAML, YAML user, I would say. And um, you, it's just in the search, uh, elusive examples now. But you could, for example, define something like a service cluster, right? And the payment team obviously needs a cluster where it can run its microservices, right? And it's, you can think of it like a, an, an, an opinionated Kubernetes cluster. And this team, you know, or well, we for this team put it in somewhere in our infrastructure as a code, of course, somewhere in a Git repository, right? And we usually, or very often, do this with custom resources in Kubernetes. We say, okay, we define custom resources in Kubernetes, which teams can provide. They can say, hey, I need this service platform, right? We put it in a, in a GitLab repo and in any kind of Git repo and define, hey, this is a service cluster for our team and there's the specification, right? Should, of course, not be the whole specification on any other Kubernetes cluster, but should have some sensible defaults and should be opinionated within our organization, right? We usually know how things are working there. We know which integrations to other systems we need. We know which logging and tracing frameworks to use. So we can, you know, provision this already in a way that it's really useful for the team, right? And, and this is really key. You know, defining this developer API, defining, you know, the, the entry point from a developer to your product. These are basically those YAML files, right? And then our platform teams usually just, you know, have their own Kubernetes cluster, right? Running with a, with a GitOps approach, Argo CD or Flux. And basically, you know, this Argo CD is just listening to this Kubernetes resource, to this custom resource, and basically, building own operators, so are using, for example, cluster API in Kubernetes, and based on this, we spin up new Kubernetes clusters, right, for those teams. And we, as I said, we give them sensible defaults. We say, hey, that's a Kubernetes cluster. We use GitOps, so you get Argo CD. We know you store your stuff in this GitLab repo where all the workloads um, are stored, and basically you can define them here, um, for example, how your microservice should look like, again, in a way, how it makes sense, and, you know, we take care of the provisioning already because your Kubernetes cluster already has all the tools in place and all the configurations to just, you know, deploy based on this um, definition now another microservice which you're looking for, right? And, and that's quite interesting if you think about this concept, right? Th that's basically quite interesting because you could also say now, okay, that was nice, but, you know, we build microservice, so we obviously also need some, some event-driven stuff these days. Um, so we need a Kafka, right? This team says we need a Kafka. So it's fair enough. So we say, hey, yeah, nice. So we have another custom resource which basically defines, hey, there's a Kafka cluster for you, right? And we, again, take this, 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 um, um, this, this resource, our Argo CD, you know, applies it to Strimps or any other operator, and basically we deploy a Kafka cluster for you in your Kubernetes cluster. Which can be a good idea, but which can also be a terribly bad idea, right? Um, running Kafka in Kubernetes. Um, so, but we're flexible. We could say, yeah, that, that's not what we want to do. Um, we basically want to, you know, give you a Kafka cluster somewhere managed, right? An MSK or an Ivan cluster, whatever it is, right? And we basically just say, okay, we do not provision this now in your Kubernetes cluster, but we provision it somewhere where we know that we usually provision our Kafka clusters to so somewhere in the cloud and give you access to this Kafka cluster, right? Or we even say, no, basically we don't want to have any own Kafka cluster for each, for each team. It's a little bit too cost intensive. All through the resilience is great. But we say we have one dedicated Kafka cluster. So we basically just give you access to this Kafka cluster. And when we deploy your Kubernetes cluster for you, we deploy it with an, with an operator, where you again can define in your workload repos now which Kafka topics do you want to have, right? You can say, hey, I want to have a payment user topic, right? I want to have, I don't know what topic. And again, Argo picks it up, basically, and deploys it to this, you know, central Kafka cluster, right? And, and, and that's self-service, right? You can basically, you know, just define with, for example, in this example of, of, of Kubernetes custom resources, a really, really nice developer API, and you can really build, you know, great, great um, um, in, um, platforms on top, on, on top of this concept. And of course, in the end, each of these teams now gets its own Kubernetes cluster, you know, um, kind of gets its own, own developer API, um, or gets a 
dedicated developer API, which they can work on and which gives them then the correct abstraction, which they obviously need. And I didn't go into much detail now. There is a colleague of mine who, who goes much more into detail and how, how, how um, platforms um, or platform engineering is, is, is obviously empowered or elevated by operators. So if you really want to see how, how you can build this from scratch, then, then probably that's the slot for you. But in the end, there are two things which are important, right? So that we provide an opinionated abstraction for our engineering teams, right? And opinionated abstractions, these are the two important things, right? If we don't provide an abstraction, we can just say, hey, go to AWS, right? And the thing is, we are in an organization, so we can really provide an opinionated abstraction. We can say, okay, microservice in our case is always a microservice with a Postgres database, right? Oh, you know, um, we always um, have, a, have, a, have a Kafka topic in included when we, when we spin up a microservice. So we can deal with this, right? We can provide custom resources which already, you know, handle this, right? And again, by doing so, we can also have a little bit of an impact on, you know, standardization and governance within the organization. And the second important thing is that we shift responsibility, right? Classical left shift in this direction, right? <laughs> but basically, we shift um, responsibility from the platform teams back to the teams which should basically take responsibility of, of their things, right? And, and that's, that's basically the key message, right? That we provide this, this minimum useful platform, this base platform where we say, okay, sure, we will operate uh, a Kubernetes and, and, and Elasticsearch for you. But basically, we just give you a platform which you can deploy on your own and which you can operate on your own, right? Platform teams are not operations. And I don't say that application teams are uh, operations either, but this is why we invented the, the very useful job of, of, of um, site reliability engineers, right? Which you can bring in your team, which are again enabling teams, if you think about the concept of team topologies, which help you then basically and operate this platform, right? And of course, allow this for extension and make this available for the future. So le let's quickly sum up. I, I think this was quite right. So let's, let's quickly summarize what I, what I wanted to tell you or what I wanted to give you. First of all, I think it's very important to understand that your platform is a product, right? Treat it like one. That, that's probably a key message. If you take one thing from it, then, then, then probably take this one, right? And, and this has a lot of implications, right? So, so really, I didn't go into detail about this now, but really think about the right team composition, right? We have seven DevOps engineers, right? And I consider myself also as a DevOps engineer. That's not man's bad, but we have seven DevOps engineers and expect from them to build a great product, right? <laughs> no startup would do it like that, right? If you have seven people in a startup, three of them are engineers, um, four of them are doing any other stuff, which is important for the product, right? So, so how can we dare to think, you know, just take those seven engineers, which do a great job, and let them build a product, right? That's totally elusive. And we really need to provide the right abstraction for, for our users, right? We really need to provide this, 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 this you know, fantastic abstraction and say, hey, this really makes my life easier, right? And, and we have hard competition, right? Hyperscale is doing a great job in, in this, right? But our big chance to really reduce the cognitive load from our teams is to provide opinionated abstractions based on our organization, right? We always know, we know which authentication authorization process we're using, right? We know which integrations we need up front, right? We can, we can provide this for them um, so that it really gets useful, right? And last but not least, we need to focus on the golden paths, right? Like in any good product, it's about priorization and depriorization, especially depriorization, right? Which things we cannot support in the platform because, you know, they will just again explode our cognitive load as platform teams, right? We really need to focus on the things that help a lot of people in the organization that, you know, fulfill 80% of the use cases, forget about the rest, right? We'll just bloat, um, we'll just bloat the complexity within your platform. And last but not least, we really, you know, need to come up with the right typology for our platform. And I, I roughly showed you four now, right? And, and none of them is bad. It's so important for me to mention this. None of them is bad. I don't... I'm not here to tell you, hey, something what you're doing is bad or doesn't, doesn't fulfill your goal. 
I just say we have those four topologies, obviously, right? We have these monolithic platforms, which at some point in time will probably lead to cognitive load within, or to high cognitive load within your platform team. We have the smaller um, platform monoliths, which basically have the same resiliency issue and which basically make it really hard to align the golden paths um, across those sub-platforms, right? We have the sharded platforms, which really are cost-intensive because we need to deploy things multiple times. And last but not least, we have this decentralized platform, which I'm using usually advocating for to say, hey, we build a product, right? You can use it, right? But, but we don't take responsibility of your usage of our product, right? We provide base SLAs all clear, right? We provide, you know, um, um, base, base statements of what, what this product can do. But in the end, it's you responsible. You're responsible for, for the usage of this product, right? And of course, there is no, no good or bad solution. And the more the right you go, right, the more features you get, right? You have a decreased placed radios, you have finer grained SLAs and, and, and scale, right? You have independent operations, you basically have more cost transparency. But you know, these features which you get out from this right part of this slide is usually something which you pay with complexity, right? Because obviously a platform monolith is the most simple thing you can do. And therefore, it's not, it's, not, it's not a bad thing to start there or to even stay there as long as possible, right? So to summarize, I, I think platforms really, they are not, you know, it's not just a hype, it's not just a buzzword, right? They really bring a lot of value in organizations if you do them right, right? But you really need to be careful when you go into this idea of building platforms for your engineering teams. Um, that you don't let your platform become your organizational bottleneck and resilience issue. Thanks a lot. I hope this was useful. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? The question was, if I'm talking about decentralized platform, uh, isn't it just not becoming an ops team? Um, no, actually, it's, from my perspective, it's the total opposite, right? Because you build a product, you build a platform, which, you know, can provision to other teams, and those teams then take responsibility of it, right? As I said, it's, it's like every other hyperscaler usually does it, right? You say, hey, I want to have an EC2 cluster. I want to have an S3 bucket. I want to have this and this and that, right? Those things, they give you a base as a last. That, that's fine, right? But in the end, you're responsible to what you do on top of those things, right? And that's usually much more easy if you say, hey, here's the platform. We deploy it for you, right? We ensure you know some kind of baseline functionality, some kind of um, baseline monitoring. But in the end, it's you who really need to take a look at alerting and stuff like that, right? AWS does also not get alerted, you know, if, 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 your, if your node pool gets, you know, bloated and stuff like that, right? It's you who needs to take responsibility of that. So it's, from my perspective, it's even the total opposite. That's why I try to push for it, or that's why we usually push for it, yeah. Make sense? Cool. Yeah? All right. With the decentralized platform, uh, how would you deal with uh, when you evolve that decentralized platform and need to maybe merge it to the uh, product teams who may have uh, initialized it earlier. Yeah. So you mean how do we keep it up to date, right? E yes. Exactly, that's the point, right? I mean, that's, uh, there's always, you know, each of these, that's actually interesting because each of these characteristics can be seen as an advantage or a disadvantage, right? The big advantage from my perspective, and, and I usually work with, you know, high-scale organizations with, 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 with 40 plus teams, just to give a little bit of context. But you, know, you don't want to upgrade this single platform where all the 40 teams are sitting out, right? It's, it's something which you want, don't want to do, right? Because you know you need to do it on a Friday afternoon. It maybe will go kaboom, and then you sit till Sunday afternoon to get everything fixed, right? And, and for us, it's usually a big advantage to say, hey, you know, we have a new version of our platform. Um, we deploy it for, you know, t two of these 50 teams and figure out, is it working, right? And then we kind of, you know, kind of an A-B rollout, uh, which you also do in, in, in other kind of software systems, right? So sure, it, it increases complexity again, right? Because you cannot say, okay, we upgraded it now for everyone, cool, right? <laughs> but we have, uh, on the other hand, the, 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 the smaller blast radius. If an upgrade doesn't work, right, we can easily roll it back for the single team, right? <clears throat> 
Hi. Uh, so my question is, uh, if we treat platform team like a product and they are mm -hmm. like providing some uh, capabilities, right? So they are developing some capabilities, building some things, and then other teams are uh, using it, basically. So they are providing, for, exa for example, some centralized logging capability. So they should uh, monitor that, operate that part uh, as well, right? So who will operate? So uh, do they provide like uh, generation of uh, centralized logging or suspending up capability yeah. or uh, actually centralized logging? Because then it doesn't make sense for the logging, right? If it's not centralized and if it's like distributed, it's not easy to trace yeah. and uh, do this kind of stuff. So. Anyway, who operates that yeah. kind of stuff? I think that's a really good question, right? Because um, I, I also wrote there that we should provide the minimal base platform. And you're fully right that tracing is something which you usually don't want to distribute, right? You usually don't want to have, you know, a distributed tracing solution in each of the, of the clusters which you deploy for your application teams. Um, that's something which you usually want to have centralized, right? Where I say, hey, we as a platform team, we provide, you know, uh, a default uh, metrics and, and tracing stack or logging stack even, right? Um, and then, of course, the platform team needs to operate it somehow, right? And this is then a little bit of a different topic. What does operations in an organization mean, right? If, if, you, if you remember just in the beginning, I showed you this, this, this kind of fantastic metrics here about autonomy and responsibility. And um, you usually cannot always expect that you work in organizations where, you know, you have really this, you build it, you run it, not even platform teams, right? And this is usually where we have site reliability engineers. So if we say, hey, we as a platform team, we need to take fully 24-7 responsibility of, I don't know, Grafana, for example, then on the one hand that we could be the ones to do it, right? Um, or we say, hey, no, we have, you know, again, dedicated people who take care of this. And this goes true also for the, the platforms we deploy for our teams, right? They obviously, in the best case, they say, hey, we take 24-7 uh, responsibility of, of the platform you deployed us, right? And you give us some base SLAs, but all the rest we take care of. But in many situations, you know, there's just not the, the knowledge, the experience to really do this then. And then I think you need these enablement teams. And these enablement teams are usually then the site reliability engineers who bring this knowledge into the teams, right? And, and the importance is that we need to decentralize this knowledge, right? If you just have this knowledge in a platform team, this will not scale, right? This will always be the bottleneck, right? And if you let the platform teams put in the, in the, in the driving seat to kind of, you know, give this knowledge to the whole organization, then they will, nothing do, they will do nothing else than, you know, enabling, right? And that's why I like this idea of site reliability engineers, whose goal is basically, you know, to, to kind of push this, you build it, you run it um, uh, mindset further by saying, hey, we help you operating it, but we are an enabling team, right? Our main goal is to get obsolete. Right? You should do it at some point in time without us, right? Yeah, I have a second question. If sure. Possible. Okay, so, uh, is that a uh, correct sentence that to treat platform team as a like, uh, cloud provider or a hosting provider kind of insight? So like, like in AWS, for example, so they yeah. provide everything. We are uh, creating our Kubernetes cluster. We are doing some things, but they, they still like do a huge amount of job behind the scenes, right? So they manage this Kubernetes cluster. But uh, every responsibility of this, if it was so not to ruin this, and uh, so it will work, and every service will be spent up, and etc., and up, up time, and etc., is on the team who is like using it basically. Sure. The, the only correct answer I can give you, unfortunately, is it depends, right? I mean, if you're an organization with, with 350 engineers, then it maybe makes sense to think in this direction, right? If you're a startup with 15 engineers, then, you know, take three people out and say, hey, you own and operate the platform. You know what I mean? So on, on the spectrum which I showed you, all of those four platform topologies um, we usually see can make sense. It, it really depends on your organization, right? It, it depends on the maturity within your teams, right? If those teams, you know, think can take a lot of responsibility anyway on their own, then the platform is anyway maybe very thin, right? If those teams are, are not really aware of, you know, cloud native infrastructure and, you know, they, they need a lot of help, then it's again another game, right? So it's really hard to answer this, this, this question generic. 
we usually say a platform team per se makes sense from 100 plus engineers, right? So, so really, platform engineering in, in terms of, hey, we built the platform as a product, right? Yeah. If, you have, if you are somewhere in this size, it starts to really pay off, right? Because it really starts to make sense to say, hey, we have five, six, seven dedicated people who really just, you know, tweak developer velocity in terms of making their life easier because providing a good platform on top of any hyperscaler usually, yeah? Yeah, that was a, that was a great answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Then I guess we can do all the other questions at the beer, hopefully, someone in the evening, and have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>